Thank you very much for the invitation. So um, can we have the next slide, please? So pharmaceutical research is now framed in the context of precision medicine, where patient populations are stratified and we can offer medicines according to the patient's very own specific genotype and provide the right drug to the right patient at the right time and at the right dose. Such as the example of the 4% of non-small cell lung cancer patients that have been genotyped and it was found that they all bear a rearrangement in the anaplastic lymphoma kinase protein that leads to carcinogenesis. So drug discovery for this specific subset of patients led to a revolutionary at the time, crizotinib, uh, that can be prescribed for anaplastic lymphoma kinase uh, patients that have this uh, rearrangement. And that was uh, uh, really revolutionary at the time. So next slide, please. So rational drug discovery is a cornerstone for precision medicine because, for example, by knowing the three-dimensional structure of a pharmaceutical target, which is usually a protein, we can now design molecules specifically designed for the target of interest. However, this strategy has so far targeted the active sites of enzymes. And as we're progressing through the years in pharmaceutical research, we find that this technique or approach is not devoid of problems. First of all, uh, given a protein's active site, uh, it can look very similar uh, to, pro to active sites of other family members, making it difficult to design a compound that doesn't actually unlock all of these enzymes and cause undesirable side effects. And second, because each enzyme has one or at most two active or orthosteric sites, so it is really difficult to design more than one blockbuster drugs for every protein, leading the pharma industry to a patent cliff. So what could be done to produce more ideas? So next slide. One of the, uh, so we can redefine actually drug discovery by using revolutionary technologies to discover new binding pockets and predict their drugability. One of the technologies that our country currently transforming biomedical research is high performance computing. With high performance computing, we can now reach unprecedented length and time scales for understanding the structure and dynamics of biomolecules, enabling the generation of new therapeutic strategies. And actually you can see in this slide that in 2015, we, an enveloped virus of uh, 200 million atoms was already simulating. And we are now leading to even more powerful computing days with the exascale era uh, just uh, on the verge. So in the next slide, how can we use this technology to actually rediscover all targets with new drugs, but also use this technology to drug proteins that have been considered so far undruggable? Next slide. The answer is a phenomenon that was first observed in 1904 by Bohr in hemoglobin, termed allostery, which in Greek means a different site. Thus, we now know that enzymes are not only regulated simply by their active or orthosteric sites, but also by other secondary sites that we have not yet discovered, at least not for all of proteins. That's why allostery has been termed by, uh, as the second secret of life. Next slide. But what is allostery exactly? A luster is a phenomenon when a ligand or modulator binds to a site other than the orthosteric or active site, changing the conformation of the orthosteric site. The substrate can still bind, but no catalysis can happen because the allosteric inhibitor or modulator has actually changed the conformation of the active site and the substrate can no longer do the catalysis. Next slide, next uh, slide, yeah. So, and it's really amazing how, as I mentioned, it was uh, discovered in 1904. So we only know this phenomenon for 120 years. And with the first allosteric drug approval by uh, the FDA happening in 2004, just 20 years ago, you can understand how this opens up a completely new drug design strategy. Next slide. But let's see some real life examples. First, the protein tyrosine phosphatase ship 2 is an oncoprotein and also an immune modulator because of its role in the programmed cell death PDL1, PD1 pathway. 
This study published by Novartis in 2019 in the Journal of Medicinal Chemistry showed that this phosphatase ship 2 can be targeted not only by one, but actually with two allosteric inhibitors in two different distinct sites and distinct from the active site, and showing in this approach that with allosteric, it is actually possible to develop compounds with good pharmacokinetics and selectivity, which has been a major challenge for phosphatases to this date. In the next slide, we can see another exciting case study, which is the modulation of PDK1, which apart from, the, from its active site, it also has a distant regulatory site termed PDK1 interacting fragment or PIF pocket. In the next slide, we can see that in fact, using the same, the very same allosteric pocket, but a different ligand in its pocket every time, one can achieve either activation of the protein with this positive allosteric modulator A to A, that you can see on the left, or an inhibitor, an allosteric inhibitor, which you can see in red in the IF8 molecule. And the activator enhances the binding of the substrates in the orthosteric pocket, facilitating the reactions and thus activating the enzymes. And the inhibitor, the allosteric inhibitor, which binds at the same pocket, acts by inducing a conformational change in the ATP pocket, blocking the catalysis. And PDK1 is a great example for allosteric because activating a kinase has not been possible in any other way except allosteric. In the next slide, we can see one of our own examples on modulating the activity of PI3 kinase alpha, a known oncogene, with the first isoform and mutant-specific PI3K inhibitors discovered, showing excellent in vivo efficacy against PI3K mutant-dependent uh, tumors in genetically modified mouse models. An allosteric site is more specific to this individual protein, potentially leading to safer medicines because, as it is isoform selective, it cannot inhibit PA3K beta, gamma, or delta. In the next slide. So how does uh, the phenomenon works exact, work exactly? Actually, the active and the inactive states of the enzymes exist in the population of the protein state, something that we call the conformational ensemble. So in the next slide, an allosteric activator can stabilize the active state and an allosteric inhibitor can then stabilize the inactive state. Therefore, allosteric is a property of the conformational ensemble, and it can be assumed that it may be a property of full dynamic properties. In the next slide, we can see that there are numerous advantages to, um, um, to designing and uh, applying allosteric modulators. So first of all, the allosteric alloster binding sites are less evolutionary conserved, which can lead to greater protein substrate selectivity, reducing side effects. We can selectively target and inhibit mutant proteins without affecting the wild type, as it's not going to target the orthosteric site. Um, allosteric inhibitors are non-competitive with endogenous ligands, which may lead up to a thousand of increase in the in vivo efficacy. We have opportunities for exploitation of all targets with new chemical space. Combination therapies with orthosteric drugs may limit their resistance profile. And actually, we can tau target proteins that have been considered undruggable because now we can discover new binding pockets as the second secret of life. So in the next slide. So um, as I mentioned, allosteric may be a general feature of proteins. And um, as we didn't know of this phenomenon, uh, at least not until 120 years ago, we can now see that uh, the uh, literature is really expanding uh, exponentially in this field. And we don't know it yet, but allosteric may well be a general feature of the proteins. In the next slide, we can see that also um, there's a constant growth in the literature of discovered allosteric inhibitors. And the next slide. Um, I, I think there's one, there's one slide uh, before that, that has a movie. So after that, I think there is a, a movie that uh, should play. Uh, 
I don't know if the movie is playing because at least I can see it. Dr. Cornea, the movie is playing on the playback. Oh, the, the, the movie is playing. Okay, great. So um, if you could play both movies, we can see in this slide that combining the power of supercomputing structural uh, data. Um, several publications have shown that the binding sites of proteins uh, can be uh, discovered, as you see in these two movies uh, of molecular dynamic simulations, where the different ligands explore the surface of a protein to discover their binding pocket. And actually, these are brute force simulations that depend on supercomputing power, uh, and they don't harness any other uh, intelligence, uh, computational techniques that we may have and that were uh, mentioned in the beginning. So when we go to the next slide, we can see that aside from supercomputing, can we actually have the tools to harness the allosterin? Is there a systematic approach to discover allosteric pockets and ligands? And in fact, the answer is yes, uh, with the power of computational chemistry, with novel tools for drug design, for example, using the CTX methodology to discover new allosteric binding sites and predict the drug ability. We can see that with this tool, we can uh, discover, you can see them in light blue, new binding sites. And actually on the picture on the right, you can see that with mixed solvent molecular dynamic simulations, you can see that the organic solvents that are sampled, they actually map very well the potential molecules, the potential new candidate drugs that can uh, bind to these new pockets that are revealed through this mixed solvent molecular dynamic simulations. And the next slide. And in fact, this wonderful technology was uh, one of the driving forces to work together with Gain Therapeutics in a European Commission funded program with uh, 3.6 million euros, uh, com combining um, different pharmaceutical companies, as you see here on the right, as well as academic institutions to apply this technology and other technologies and train the next generation of scientists in allosteric in drug discovery. The next slide. Uh, so it is my strong belief that the landscape of new classes of drug therapies will come from allosteric drugs. While drug discovery is challenging and has encountered many successes, of course, but many highly costly failures, the allosteric drug space has barely been explored. The fact that many proteins are considered undruggable does not imply that this is indeed the case. Transient allosteric pockets, such as the ones revealed with the technology I just showed you, uh, in these undruggable proteins or in proteins with which the druggable proteins uh, associate uh, directly or indirectly, can uh, and will lead to therapeutic advances. And without doubt, allosteric will lead the drug discovery efforts of the future. And the next question is, next slide, do you want to be part of this future? So thank you very much.